You know what I'm absolutely fed up of is people demonizing the car. Now, if you're referring to Christine or the car from the horror movie, then okay, you can demonize those. You know what? I'll even give you car, you know, the evil twin from Kit in Knight Rider. But ever since the car widely became adopted over 100 years ago, it's been beneficial to our lives. It's given us the freedom to travel, to go where we want, when we want. It's been crucial to our transportation needs. The automobile has given us motorsport, it's aided our leisure activities, and frankly, it's given us something to obsess over and love. Plus, cars and road transport has helped people earn their living. And if you consider things like police cars or more likely rescue vehicles, then it's fair to say, cars have even helped save our lives but the car apparently if you listen to what people are saying is evil and bad for us well I'm sorry but no to suggest in any way that the car is evil or bad for humanity is outrageous and unjustified and in this video I'll respond directly to the case against the car Brown car guy. So there's loads of people out there trying to tell you that the car is bad. In fact, it seems to be a trend now to be negative about the car. It's claimed that the car is just a big, ugly, gross, mechanical, people and environmental killer. Basically, that the car is guilty of murdering us and the environment. Now, there are some negative aspects to the existence of the automobile. How can there not be? But they cannot possibly outweigh all the benefits of cars, just a few of which I've already mentioned in the introduction. Nonetheless, let's examine the case against the car. Brown car guy. Now the most obvious thing that people often talk about is road traffic accidents and the casualties that result from those. Now let me first state that even a single death is a death too many and my heart weeps for anyone who's lost a friend, a relative, or a loved one due to a road traffic accident. And my total and utter sympathies for all those maimed, injured, or traumatized by a road accident. It is indeed a horrible thing to happen, and fate can be cruel sometimes. According to the World Health Organization, or WHO, um, most of these figures, in fact, that I'm going to talk about in this video actually come from them, so you'll be able to Google all of these facts quite easily. Anyway, that organization says that globally, road traffic accidents, or let's call them RTAs, um, they cause 1.35 million deaths. This includes pedestrians, cyclists, motorcycles, as well as, of course, the people in the cars. Of course, it also includes deaths caused by various contributing factors, such as bad roads uh, or traffic conditions, poorly maintained vehicles, and people behavior, such as bad driving and dangerous pedestrian activities. Now, these are particularly big factors in poorer or developing nations. In the UK, there are around 1,700 deaths per year and that is sad, but it should be said that despite there being more cars and drivers than ever before, but due to better engineering, technology, and the construction of cars, these things have all made the cars safer than ever, and that number has fallen considerably over the years. So in fact, if you go back to 1966, for example, there were 8,000 deaths from RTAs in the UK, and as I've already stated in recent years, that number is now 1,700. The UK is, in fact, one of the lowest in the world for road traffic casualties. And you know what? When it comes to accidents, there's a figure that might surprise you. In the UK, 6,000 people a year die from accidents in the home. Brown car guy. Now, thinking about that global 1.35 million figure for road traffic accidents, which is pretty huge, but keep in mind that in terms of the main reasons globally for humans dying, RTAs only come in at number 10. Now, that's after cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory illness, lower respiratory infections, so pneumonia, flu, etc., Alzheimer's disease and dementia, then you've got diabetes, kidney disease, other infectious diseases, and liver disease. 
And if you want a really terrifying number, let's go back and look at the number one on that list, cardiovascular diseases. They account for a staggering 17.9 million deaths a year globally. 17.9 million. That's 31% of deaths worldwide are caused by that. In the UK, the number is 159,000 annually. So maybe instead of a war on cars, we should be waging a war on cholesterol and blood pressure. 9.5 million deaths around the world are due to cancer and cancer-related illnesses. It's about 135,000 in the UK. Smoking kills 8 million people, 78,000 uh, a year in the UK. And how about alcohol? Well, that causes 3 million deaths a year, about 7,500 in the UK. Now, that's still higher than the number of RTA deaths, by the way. And of course, so is the fact that drug use causes 4,500 deaths in the UK, about half a million worldwide. Brown card. Now, some will have noted that respiratory illnesses was third on the list of the biggest global uh, killers. And that's often attributed to emissions from road transport. Global deaths from pollution, though it's clearly stated that that's pollution from various sources, but it does cause 4.2 million deaths annually. However, that pollution, like I said, could be from industry, power generation, uh, and even heating and household cooking. Yep. Household cooking was actually mentioned on that and you thought you were a bad cook. <laughs> In the UK, we're talking about an estimated 68,000 deaths from pollution, although it's hard to be exact when, for example, in London, there's only one death recorded in a 20 year period from 2001 to 2021 as being directly due to air pollution. And even for that, it states, and I quote, this death was attributed to environmental air pollution. However, we are unable to determine whether this involved car emissions. Of course, there is no question that road traffic emissions do contribute to this. It's a given and it's inevitable, especially in cities and congested urban environments. And one study uh, links particular emissions from vehicles to an estimated 385,000 deaths globally in 2015. But as I must emphasize again, road traffic is only one of several causes of pollution. And as has been widely reported, one study has revealed that particular emissions in the London underground is 15 times higher than on London's busiest roads. In fact, a report on the BBC News the other night on TV actually showed the cleaners working down there overnight. It's so bad in the tunnels that they use uh, magnets basically to scoop up all the metallic dust and, and all the other pollutants that are down there and, and uh, other gunk, which actually includes human skin. And as they were cleaning it, you could actually see this stuff, uh, much of it still just floating around in the air. And you just think that they're just never going to be able to clean all of that. It is truly horrendous and disgusting, and yet no one is talking about just how dangerous that is. Brown card. Sticking with London, historically, since the year 1700, the busy capital city has seen a worsening of air pollution over two centuries. In fact, the suspended particulate matter in London's air actually doubled in that time. But think about this, the pollution peaked in London at the end of the 19th century and went into a steep decline afterwards and is now 40 times lower. To be fair, there are many contributors to that decline, particularly industrial activity, but it would be remiss of me not to remind everyone that it coincides with the transition to the horseless carriage, i.e. cars. In fact, at the time of the car's introduction, it was hailed as a clean, healthy, and environmentally friendly form of transport compared to what we had before, which of course was horses. It's worth pausing on this point because if, as some would suggest, that we simply get rid of the car, what is the alternative? Most of us simply can't walk everywhere and to suggest so is utter nonsense. So do we want to go back to horses? Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Would you like to know how delightful having horses as your main form of transport would be in a major city. Let's take the example of 19th century New York City, where there were up to 200,000 horses living and working in the city. Now, horses produce 10 kilograms of poo each. You're talking about 2,000 tons of horse manure a day. Plus, there were up to 15,000 dead horses lying around the city at one time, having passed from disease, age, and just being overworked. 
and the carcasses wouldn't be removed because they're too heavy. So they would just wait for them to decay. Unsurprisingly, all of that poo and rotting flesh brought disease and it is estimated that up to 20,000 New Yorkers died annually because of that. And if you're thinking that, well, now we'd use bicycles, of course, not horses. Well, you know what? They did have bicycles back then too. But interestingly enough, in major cities like New York, and of course, indeed here in London as well, riding a horse or using a horse-drawn carriage was clearly considered a better choice. And thinking about how bad the weather is here, it's not really surprising, is it? Brown car guy. So to the accusation that cars are destroying our environment, I mean, sure, cars are not the cleanest things around, let's be honest, but let's examine the carbon footprints, shall we? A typical passenger vehicle emits about 4.6 tons of carbon dioxide per year that's in use. Now building a new car, so this is the carbon footprint before it's been delivered to its first owner, creates a carbon footprint of around 5.6 tons. By the way, it's worth mentioning at this point that the carbon footprint of producing an electric car can be up to 20 tons or more compared to an ICE car, depending on usage and the source of the energy used to charge the car, that could mean that it takes up to eight or nine years to even out. But anyway, back to the original figure, we're talking just under five tons a year to run your existing car. That is your harmful contribution to the environment as a motorist. Sounds bad, right? Five tons a year. So we should get rid of the cars, right? Actually, you should get rid of yourself first because the annual carbon footprint of an average human in the UK is 10 tons per year. And it's the highest in America where it can be up to 16 tons a year. Or maybe you should just knock your house down because Average annual emissions are 8.1 tonnes from a, an average house. In fact, an average household produces an additional 8 tonnes a year to feed its occupants. Although you can save about 30% of that if you are a vegetarian household. This is what makes me laugh. When they talk about achieving net zero, how is that even possible with human activity? The only way to achieve net zero is ultimately to get rid of humanity. So considering that we're not actually doing any harm to the planet itself, because the Earth will continue to function and exist long after we're gone, as they say, it's not the planet that needs saving, it's us. The stability of the environment is crucial to our existence and well-being. However, are we saying that we need to get rid of humans in order to make the planet safe for humans to live on? In the words of Spock, that is not logical. There's a bit of an automotive dilemma here, isn't there? Because especially as most people reckon that if they switch up to a newer car, they'll be doing good for the environment. Well, in fact, according to a study from which.co.uk, the CO2 from newer cars has actually increased. This is partly because newer cars tend to be bigger, heavier, there's more technology in them. And it's partly due to, in fact, technology that ironically enough is making them safer and healthier for humans because harmful emissions such as particulate matter, nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxides has actually gone down. And of course, as already mentioned, with EVs, you get a lot less of the harmful emissions for humans. Not entirely though, because you still have particulate matter emissions from things like brakes and tires, etc. But you do have that higher carbon footprint to, of the production to start with. Now, electric cars are great for us, but when people talk about switching everyone over to EVs, think about the environmental catastrophe caused by producing enough EVs in order to do that. In any case, it's not possible because we just can't mine uh, the lithium we need for that many batteries quickly enough. It's just not actually possible. So bizarrely enough, EVs are actually better for humans than they are for the environment. Has anyone actually told environmentalists this? So what's the answer then? Well, it's been said before and I'll say it again. The best car for the environment is actually an old car. The longer you keep an existing car running, the less resources you're using and hence a minimal impact on the environment. So you know what? The best thing to do is to run your car into the ground and scrap, scrap it schemes because they are wasteful and actually disastrous for the environment. Brown car guy. The car is making us fat. Oh yes, that accusation has also been leveled at the automobile. The argument goes that cars make us less healthy because we don't walk. In fact, our health and fitness has got nothing to do with cars but other stuff entirely. 
The Obesity Research and Clinical Practice Journal found that it's harder for adults today to maintain the same weight as people from 20 to 30 years ago, even at the same levels of food intake and exercise, and this is not because we're driving more, it's because we're exposed to more chemicals in our food and food packaging, plus prescription drugs also have had an impact. So there's other potentially more serious factors at play here. The argument that cars are making us fat is a complete and utter nonsense argument. As for myself, I got a story. During the pandemic, I got a rotator cuff issue that meant I could barely move this arm. And I was given a series of exercises that probably got me back to 80% movement, but it still wasn't quite right. And there was still pain there. However, when I got my classic BMW, which I mostly wash and polish myself, usually once a week, that's actually what fixed this. So the car has actually helped my personal health issue. And finally, the claim that cars have dehumanized society, that locked in our mobile tin boxes, we've become selfish and unsociable. Okay, speaking anecdotally, I have to say, what a load of bollocks. Oh, sorry, I mean, that's a cauldron of crap. It's an absurdity on a planet of ludicrousness called idiocy. I have more friends and acquaintances that came about through cars, car events, and car communities than in any other way, and that's across the world. In fact, if it wasn't for cars, and I kid you not, I'm being honest here, I would be a total Mr. Billy No Mates. Cars bring people together. I used to organize these massive car meets in Dubai, which is a city, uh, is a real melting pot of people from different parts of the world who don't necessarily always come together socially. But these events would bring all of these different communities together just for the love of the automobile. Okay, forget car meets. Just driving around in my classic BMW, uh, people tend to chat with you at traffic lights or in traffic if it's possible. And this is a regular occurrence. Of course, that's got a lot to do with the fact that I like chatting to people, I like saying hello, and I like you know, you know, interacting with people. And that's the point. You can't blame cars for people not being friendly and sociable. There are many other issues that can cause uh, coldness, or in fact, cold communities that have lost the will and desire to engage uh, and interact with each other. I think you'll find that sort of thing comes from things like stress and anxiety caused by stuff like cost of living crisis, political oppression, and the hardships of life that make everyone too depressed to want to interact with each other. Plus, if anything, cars actually help you to get around so that you can meet your friends and your family, to get you to social engagements, to community events, to volunteer campaigns, and other activities that actually bring people together and increase your likelihood of positive social interaction. And the notion that people are friendlier on public transport, on buses and trains. Um, have you been on the London Underground? No commuter on public transport wants to chat. And as for cyclists, they just seem to want to shout at car drivers and pedestrians all the time. So that's a nonsense of a romantic view. Talking of romance, the car has facilitated many first dates and love stories, of course, as I'm sure many of you would be able to testify. Anyway, so that argument has completely been run off the road, as have all of the arguments, I believe, in my video. And if you think differently, let me know. Put it in the comments. Or even if you agree and have further uh, arguments or facts or statistics to substantiate the case for the defense, then please let me know. Put those in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. And let me know what you thought of this video. Thanks so much for watching. Catch you in the next one. Brown card. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please, please hit the like button and share this video as well if you can. And while you're at it, check out these guys who also sponsor my content. I am deeply grateful to them because it helps me to buy new equipment, put fuel in the cars, and yes, buy a cup of coffee. You can do the same. Just go here or right here on YouTube. Just hit these three little dots down here and click on thanks. Make sure you're signed in first. My content is free. But this is how you can help me keep it that way. I may even send you a gift. Oh, by the way, watch this next.